Hi guys. Today's Wednesday lesson of the day on Thursday, as we've continued the tradition on Wednesday to Thursday, is pretty much me talking shit. And the point of this lesson of the day is that there was a recurrent pattern of visitors this week um, who believed incorrect things and patients who believed incorrect things said by doctors. So the point of this is to ground everybody to live in reality and stop living in imagination. And the problem with really uh, intelligent, creative people is sometimes they can stray and deviate from reality and make up their own realities and live in them. Um, I was raised by a dad like this. So we need to ground ourselves when we're looking at uh, surgeons and surgery and everything that we're doing. And uh, the first thing that I teach the fellows that come and visit in the residence is really how to become a good surgeon is to figure out these things. And the first thing is to change the way you look at the world because uh, most people look at the world uh, very positively and look at it as though everybody's intelligent, everybody's smart, everybody's great. And that's fantastic to be an optimist. Unfortunately, it's, it's not reality. Uh, not every surgeon is great, not every artist is great, not every chef is great, uh, not every bus driver is great. This is the reality of the world, is that there are exceptional people and non-exceptional people. And if you want to learn and you want to advance and you want to be the best, you have to follow the top, the top 5% and those people. Uh, so that's the first thing I tell them is realize. And I say, what's the most popular filler in the world? They say, what's the worst filler in the world? I say, what's the most popular facelift in the world? It's masplication. What's the worst type of facelift? It's masplication. So you have to understand that the most popular is usually the worst thing. Uh, common sense is common. People don't get that. It's common. It's not great sense. It's common sense. That's what the sense that most people would have. Uh, what we're doing here in surgery is uh, trying to be the best. What you're doing in any field is really trying to be the best. And you don't want to be common. You don't want to have common sense. You don't want to have common taste. Common sense and common taste are average and uh, those things are not impressive. They don't impress me. They don't impress anybody. And it just keeps people average and the same. There's no advancement. There's no change. And the way to be the best surgeon, uh, people get confused. They think it goes by patient satisfaction. That's great to keep patients happy, and I love to keep patients happy, and I care about patients. And it's important to care about patients, but that's not what makes you a great surgeon. That's not what produces great results. Being selfish is what produces great results. Looking at your results and analyzing them over and over again and always thinking that it's not good enough, that's how you become a great surgeon. So. You're not doing the surgery for the patient necessarily, you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it for your own results to look at your own before and after and to be critical about it and to judge yourself and say, am I good enough? And if you're not, you keep getting better and you keep improving. If you do it for the patients, you're probably never gonna be that great because patients can be happy with average results and they can come in and say, doctor, thank you so much. They're like some nice people with low expectations and they love you and they say it's great. It doesn't mean your results are great. Uh, the only way to really advance the result is to put the patient uh, expectations kind of aside. That's a whole different thing. You want to keep them happy, of course, but it's really to do it for yourself and to be selfish about the results. And I tell all my patients all the time, they say, uh, you know, you must really go overboard trying to do these things for patients. That's why you're so great. And I correct them. I say, well, I'm pretty selfish, actually. That's why I do this is because I like to do it for myself and I like to look at my before and afters and be proud of them. I go on medical missions, not because... I'm somebody who loves to give to other people. I like that, it's nice, but I do it because I love going on these trips and I love doing the surgeries and I love playing with kids and I love doing those kind of things and my selfish nature helps benefit other people and the world works out better for you when it's like that. But the things that I went through today and recently that are not reality, um, and I wanna kind of repeat this over and over again until people understand that just because something is parroted or repeated in the surgical world or any kind of world does not mean that it's true, okay? Um, most people, again, have common sense, which is common, it's not that fantastic, and you, you can look at our political world and our last few presidents and you'll, you'll understand. Um, yeah, we, we, we sometimes make wrong choices and uh, we sometimes repeat things that we think are correct and they're not correct. So the things that I've noticed, let's talk about a few of them. One of them, and this is a lecture that I gave in San Diego recently and I insulted everybody in the audience. They all took it kind of well 
fortunately, uh, was I asked uh, who in the audience believes in the concept of overcorrection. Overcorrection in a surgery is when you pull something this far back and then people look crazy and then you expect it to settle like 20% uh, or fail 20%. That's the concept of overcorrection. Overcorrection for me, it's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard because you are inherently putting into your recipe disaster. You're putting in a little bit of failure. Overcorrection means you're putting it this far to fail 20%, 30%. And the thing that's wrong with that is it's not predictable. You don't know if it's going to fail 20%, 30%. You don't know how much it's going to fail. They say it's settled, but it's really failing. So you don't know how much it's going to fail. And when it fails, it fails from somewhere. And it usually fails from the incision, meaning you get scarring there because it's pushing or pulling away from the incision. So rather than having overcorrection, why not figure out a better way to do a brow lift or a better way to do a surgery where there's no overcorrection. You just get it to where it needs to be with no tension, be a little more logical about it, and everything tends to work out. Same as where they pull brow lifts. If you pull someone's brow lift in the direction of surprise, so the direction of surprise is frontalis contracture. This is your frontalis muscle. Inquisition, surprise. It's that direction. What's gonna happen when you lift somebody in the exact same direction as surprise. You're gonna always have some kind of appearance of surprise. It may be minimal, it may be major, it really just depends, but that's the wrong direction. So uh, these are things that people have to understand. The other thing I heard uh, over and over again was it will smooth out, meaning you're doing a surgery and you leave a bunch of ripples on the field and the doctor says, oh, it'll smooth out. Why would you leave somebody, you know, something to chance when a doctor is so neurotic about every other thing they do Everything has to be perfect in the operating room. They yell at people, they scream at people, everything has to be perfect. And at the end of the surgery, they say, ah, that'll smooth out. It's crazy to think that you would be a doctor who's type A personality and everything has to be perfect. And yet, and yet you say, I'm gonna overcorrect and let it settle, or I'm gonna leave ripples and let it smooth out over time. Now, ripples and irregularities, they do happen after surgery and those do smooth out. But if you're on the field and you've got a dog ear, you've got something else like that, you don't leave it to chance, you fix it. The reason people leave things to chance is because their predecessors told them that it would be normal. Their predecessors repeated things so many times that they said it would be normal. There are many things in plastic surgery that are repeated and they're repeated in literature and they're interpreted incorrectly. And because they're repeated so many times, people take them as fact. They misread statistics, they misread articles in literature, they don't fully understand them. So the other non-realistic thing is misinterpretation of data. Patients come in and they say, well, I heard that 5% of people get revisions for whatever, so that means I have a 5% chance. I heard that 60% of fat survives when you do fat grafting. This is a misinterpretation of data. A doctor doing a fat grafting procedure, assuming that 60% of uh, fat will survive, he will inherently or she will do an extra 40% of fat, assuming that 60% will survive in order to get the proper Result, this is a misinterpretation of data. They read an article that looked at a thousand patients in a population that said the average was 60% survival of fat when you did fat transfer from the abdomen to the face. That's a population statistic. It's not an individual statistic, which means if you look at the individuals in that study, all thousand of them, one of them could have had 0%, one of them could have had 100%, one of them had 20%, one of them had 70%, which means the doctor's chance of fat survival is 60%. The patient's chance is zero to 100%. However, doctors will misinterpret that data. They'll take a population statistic, which applies to them, and they'll apply it to the individual patient they're treating, which means they'll inject the patient with an extra 40% instead of assuming that the patient may have 0% or 100%. So they, they, they don't know how to apply statistics. This is the misinterpretation, uh, misinterpretation we always see. The other thing I hear all the time is uh, during facelifts is getting muscle tightening or mass tightening. I had several patients come in today saying, do you do muscle tightening? Do you do mass tightening? I read about it. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? What? And it's not the patient's fault. They read this from doctors. And I asked doctors, oh, what are you talking about? Muscle tightening. What is muscle tightening? I don't understand. Like if you could do muscle tightening, I would tighten my muscles. Like I've, I don't understand what muscle tightening is. A muscle contracts. So... I don't know what muscle tightening is. Is it muscle flexing? Is it muscle contraction? Is What is muscle tightening? I've heard this so many times, yet I don't understand conceptually what it really is because I don't think it exists. 
but people have repeated it so many times that you think muscle tightening exists. It makes no sense. Muscles contract. They relax, they contract. They relax, they contract. There's no such thing as muscle tightening. Then you hear of SMAS tightening. SMAS tightening also makes no sense. The SMAS, which is the superficial muscular ponderotic system, is a system of fascia connected to muscle. How do you tighten the muscle? How do you tighten the SMAS? The SMAS, the fascial components are a hydratory layer with fat and fascia and water. It's a cushion layer that provides support and volume under the skin. It supports it. So when you heat it, you don't tighten it like this, you shrink it like this, it deflates. So everybody says SMAS tightening, SMAS tightening. They don't even, I, don't, I have no idea what SMAS tightening is. How are you gonna uh, tighten a SMAS? You can only shrink a SMAS, deflate a SMAS, hollow a SMAS, dehydrate a SMAS, shrink the fat in a SMAS. You cannot tighten a SMAS. It doesn't exist, it cannot happen. Now, why are they confused? Because during surgery, they'll sit there and they'll start cauterizing this area over here and they'll see the Chopra is calling me cutting off my, my signal here. So because of that, they assume that the contracture that they saw with their own two eyes represents a true contracture and tightening of tissue in real world, which it does not. So what are they observing? What are they seeing when they think that it's doing that? What are people seeing when they do a laser of CO2 around the eye and they see the skin shrink and they think that that's real collagen tightening? They misinterpret the data. What do they think they're seeing <laughs> is they think that they're seeing true tightening. What they're actually seeing is called explosion. They are heating up water and they are evaporating it. And when you vaporize water, you shrink the entire tissue. Now that area is gonna get rehydrated and repair it sometime. It doesn't stay tightened, it doesn't do that. If anything, it only deflates. So the same doctor who is doing all this deflation over here by my definition, their own definition is they're doing SMAS tightening, but realistically, they're just hollowing this area will go do a SMAS plication where they hollow the rest of the face and then they'll fat graft the entire face. So they hollow this area, then they go preach fat grafting and volumization because you lose volume with age and they volumize the rest of the face. So it's a little counterintuitive and a little contradictory that you would hollow it and then add volume. So uh, these things are misinterpreted, misunderstood. The other thing I've heard is to improve skin quality during a facelift, you have to go past the last wrinkle and elevate the skin more and pull on the skin more. Now, we've clearly proven this wrong with deep plane surgery. You see deep plane surgery where we leave all the skin attached and the support system to the skin is the hypodermis and the SMAS. We leave it attached to the support system, you get less problems. Anytime you lift the skin off the support system, it starts to retract, you automatically produce tension on it. And we've noticed that doesn't help. So people have accepted, we're gonna go over to deep plane a little bit more. And the same doctors that have slowly accepted this with force and repetition of our results being better because you look at our photos and they're better, still resist on some point where they say, no, 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 well, here's deep plane, but down here you need to elevate all skin in order to get rid of wrinkles. I always compare this to like religious people who uh, they're like, no, we have to keep kosher and we have to do this, that, but then they have like premarital sex. So they choose like one part of the Torah or the Bible and then they ignore all the others. I don't care which one you do, but it's a bit of hypocrisy or a bit of convenience for them. The same exists in surgery where they will conveniently believe in one thing yet ignore the other thing. So whether it's hypocrisy or whatever it is, or self-contradiction, you can't hollow this area and then just be like, I wanna volumize the face. You can't say I believe in deep plane here, but then not believe in it down here. Deep plane exists everywhere. And well, not everywhere, but you get the point. Skin quality problems are very different than skin excess and most surgeons believe that there's a ton of skin excess that's formed. I haven't met one person in the world other than hyperelastosis patients who really develop a bag of skin over age. It may look like their skin is excessive but what happens is their skin used to be tucked up here and it would have to travel around the jaw, down here, over there, around all these contours. So the surface area was longer and it would wrap around all these areas and the skin would look healthier because it was wrapped around all these areas and had some volume under it, it had some fat under it. Then you lose some of that volume and you blunt everything and now it's a straight line from here to here. So now you have all this, what appears to be skin excess, but you improve the contours again and you tuck everything back up, the skin has to travel a longer distance again and it looks better automatically. So you don't have that much skin excess. Now, they, they don't believe in this somehow for skin, but they believe in it for platysma. They say, okay, yeah, I believe the platysma 
when we redrape it, it needs to travel longer distance, so they do myotomies in it. But somehow they don't believe in skin that it exists. So uh, a matter of uh, belief of convenience. So um, that's another thing that just for the surgeons who need to understand, look at my results. Look at my results. Go look at my face results. I don't dissect skin past here. And I get improvements all the way down along the clavicle, more so than somebody who elevated the entire face and neck. So every time we have this argument with surgeons and I try to explain to them, you don't need to elevate that much skin, just improve your contours more. They go look back 20 years in their shit photos and they find one photo uh, to prove their point. But I go back and look at their other thousand photos after they send me their one shit photo and I see that they're all trash. But this is how people justify what they do and then they spread the lie. They keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it and they keep getting average results. Yet there's people who excel in the fields of facial plastics and they are the ones, or plastics, and they're the ones who are getting the better results and they're doing different things than everybody else. So always believe in that top 5%. Another fallacy or another lie that's been repeated over and over again to residents is the concept of redistribution of tension or tacking sutures, where you would take human tissue, which has turnover, meaning it reproduces itself at a given time, you pull it up, you put it with tension somewhere, and then you say, okay, that's gonna be my tacking stitch, and then I'm gonna cut all the skin out, and then everywhere else it's gonna redistribute the tension. This is not reality. Reality is tension is tension, and if you don't get rid of tension, tension's always there, whether it's in a deeper layer or a superficial layer. Deep tension, or putting tension on a deep layer doesn't get rid of tension on the superficial layer. There's tension everywhere still, which is why your results fail, which is why they're not as big, which is why you scar more. So that whole concept is a lie. Now residents come and visit and it's hard for me to explain all these things in one day. And I try to tell them, I go, please don't believe everything you've heard. It is not true. And they say, what do you mean? I go, have you heard of redistribution of tension? They say, yes. I go, it's a lie. It doesn't exist. It's not real. What do you mean? I say, well, if you have tension in the face, it's gonna be there no matter what you do on a deep layer or superficial layer. And at some point your tension holding suture is gonna grow cells on the other side of it. They call that cheese wiring and they think it's just stretching against around the tissue, uh, microscopic cells don't stretch. They grow on the other side and they grow more cells. So it's hypertrophy. So they end up growing more cells, but they're growing it and pulling away from your stitch that you use to tack everything up. So those things aren't real. I had a patient come in today and said, well, the doctor uh, did some fat grafting around my cheek and some filler and used the cannula and passed it around everywhere using a subcision technique to release the ligaments. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And her cheeks, and I love her to death. She's like, I've known her for eight years and she's wonderful. So I hope you don't mind that I'm giving you as an example. I won't use your name ever. And she's so beautiful, so pretty, but now her cheeks are overfilled. And um, one doctor believes that they were releasing uh, ligaments when putting fat around them and getting rid of indentations on the face. Whereas the other doctor, me, I'm like, what are you talking about? How do you release a ligament? Because I'm a surgeon, I've been in there. So I don't know what they're talking about when they say release ligaments. I don't understand what they mean when they say mass tightening. I don't, you know, I, I live in reality. I don't understand these things. Uh, and in his mind or her mind, they are releasing ligaments and improving contours. In my mind, they are flooding muscles. They flooded the muscles of the face and the muscles of the face don't work anymore. You can't smile. There's muscles that come all the way across over here and now they have all this fat and filler around them uh, with the intent of releasing some ligament that I don't even know exists or how you'd release it, but I don't understand it fully. Uh, but re in reality, what they did was they flooded the facial musculature. So their intent was to lift the face and improve contours. Their result was that they got the face fatter, worsened contours, and it will now accelerate aging and drooped it. So that's the reality of what happens with these things. Uh, so yes, we have good intent, but unless you live in reality, you end up doing the opposite of what you want, which is why I tell everybody that I teach or talk about, I say, just live in reality. Like you don't have to say sculpture produces collagen to people. That's like a stupid thing to say. Why would you say that? Sculpture does produce collagen, but it's misleading because people think collagen is always a good thing. They don't know that collagen can be a bad thing. They don't know that keloids are collagen. They don't know that hypertrophic scars are collagen. They don't know that fibrotic tissue is collagen. They don't know that all the uh, adhesions around their ovaries after surgery are collagen, unless you tell them that way. So when you put sculpture in the face, you're depositing collagen, but you're doing it with scar tissue formation. And I like sculpture, I use it, 
just because I say these things doesn't mean I don't like it. I like Sculptra, but I'm realistic about it. And because I'm realistic about it, my results will be more reproducible than somebody who just believes in their fantasy that is producing healthy collagen. And they go inject it everywhere into the skin, thinking it works like a laser. And they go put it underneath and they think it works like a laser and it's like putting vitamins in the skin. And they get nodules sometimes, they get irregularities sometimes. Whereas when I use Sculptra, I never get problems because I understand what it does. And I accept that it's forming scar tissue. And I put it down deep in the cheek to form bulk. It's a bulk former. That's what I use it for. I use other things for other things. So because I'm realistic, my complication rate goes down. My issues go down, my success rate goes up. Whereas the other people just kind of blame it on complications that happen. They say, oh, well, yeah, you know, there's a one in a million chance that this happens. There's a one in a thousand chance that this happens. A one in a thousand chance is a lot. One in a hundred chance is a lot. You know, injecting uh, Kenalog every single time for a pimple on somebody without severe cystic acne, it's probably not a good idea. You're going to get more problems that you can't fix. So use something else if you're realistic about what this stuff does. Um, so that's my, my rant for today is it's very difficult uh, trying to retrain surgeons who visit um, especially the younger ones who look up to everybody who have heard these things so many times they think it's reality. I would advise you not to believe what most people think. 95% of the world has not advanced the world. They live in the world. They can be your friends. 5% of the world, 1% of the world are the people who advance things. So you have to look out to see who are those people. It could be somebody who's never contributed anything in their lives and they do come up with something. So it's not always the person, but you have to find that 1% of ideals, 1% of reality that is better than everything else. And then that's how you excel. So I struggle a bit because things are parroted and repeated and people think because it's repeated, it's real. This is not true. It can be repeated a million times and it may not be real. It can be published in a peer reviewed journal and it may not be true or it may be misinterpreted. So um, that's all before I run out of breath. Uh, I hope that the residents visiting can watch this video and just hear those things so I don't repeat them every time and sound like a moron uh, repeating. I don't like repeating myself. I like to say things once. I like to originally create things. I don't like to say things over and over again uh, because I don't feel original. I don't like to tell the same joke twice. I don't like to cook the same thing twice. Um, That's why I like to change surgery all the time and keep improving it. If I plateau on a surgery, I get bored and I don't wanna do it anymore. It's not creative, it's not fun for me. So we did this with like the NanoFat PRP stuff. I did hundreds of these and got it to the best point it could possibly be at and I plateaued and then I kinda of lost interest in doing it. Um, and that's how I am with some procedures, but I am like that with every conversation. I like to always be original, always create something. So hopefully if I just put this out there, maybe I'll make the residents watch it before they come visit. Um, do appreciate you guys listening to my little rant. We have one question here by Fadia Jafari. Can you fix malar edema? Unrelated, but why not? Uh, I have heard many fallacies about malar edema and people try to do crazy things to fix malar edema. One is they try to fill around it. <laughs> so that makes no sense. So malar edema, so everyone's aware, is an area over here uh, on the zygoma where uh, we call this the malar region. There's a malar um, basin where the fluid has to drain around here and go there before it goes down. It can't gravitate inferiorly. So malar edema happens in people with either allergies, uh, higher salt intake, higher alcohol intake, uh, poor lymphatic drainage, uh, overfilled faces because they can't drain surgery in the past in some cases where um, they disconnected too many things, but that's uncommon. Uh, but all these things can lead to malar edema. So how do you treat it? Most patients in LA are treated for malar edema by dissolving their filler. And you just dissolve it and it, goes away about like 50% or something. Um, the other ways to treat malar edema are scarification or cicatrization, where you try to go actually uh, just kill the dead space there. And this can be done with sclerosing agents uh, like doxycycline, tetracycline, bleomycin, I wouldn't, but uh, those are kind of inflammatory and unpredictable. You don't really want to use those things there. Or you can do it with radiofrequency treatments, which tend to be a little more predictable. Sometimes CO2 might help. The thing is most people don't understand which layer uh, this is occurring in. So, uh, and I fully don't know which layer it occurs in. Um, it tends to look like it's in the superficial spongy layers, uh, but it's really hard to tell. So when people treat these areas, they do radio frequency deep to superficial, and there used to be about a 50% success rate with Fractora, and then 
Now with uh, Matrix and Morpheus, the success rate, success rate is a little bit higher. Um, you have Dr. Honig, I think, does um, profound mixed with CO2 laser, a few treatments, and he's got a very high success rate. So uh, there's a bunch of ways to treat it. Most people just by um, avoiding high salt intake, uh, MSG, Chinese food, <laughs> um, red wine, and those things, it tends to get better, or by sleeping with their head a little bit elevated. You don't want to sleep flat. So let's see any other questions here. Fantastic. All right, wonderful. So I will head home now. Tomorrow, um, my friend and I are gonna be performing profound radio frequency skin tightening and PRP for the hair together. So I've done two hair transplants. Uh, I've done PRP to maintain it. I wish I'd started it sooner, uh, but we're gonna do that tomorrow. So I'll, I'm not gonna film his, but I'll film mine uh, so you guys can watch to see what I look like in pain. And just so you know, everybody in the office has uh, volunteered to stab me in the face. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm likable, <laughs> you know? Uh, they just, they wanna help me. So everyone else have a fantastic night and I will post this in case you guys wanna see my psycho ranting abilities.